Good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I want to add my welcome. If you are brand new to North Langley, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you've come with a friend or a family member, we just hope that you already feel at home. For those of you who are new to Jesus, uh, I, I'm just so glad you're here. And if you're on a journey, maybe you're not new, new to Jesus, but uh, you've not yet wanted to become a Christian. You're still exploring a little bit more of who, who God is. You're trying to learn a little bit more about his love. We're just glad that you're here. We're glad you're on this journey. Um, and today we're going to end this series, uh, this eight-week series. There may be some hallelujahs deep within some of you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know how many I don't wish it would end there are. It's been eight weeks, so um, I don't know what your experience is, but I hope that on this journey, we're going to kind of reflect. We're going to do some reflecting today on what has happened in the last seven weeks. But uh, if this is your first Sunday, this is the end of a series, an eight-week journey exploring the heart of Jesus when it comes to identity, sexuality, and gender. And so today uh, on this final uh, sermon in the series, uh, I've entitled it The Well, The Spirit, and the next sexual revolution. The well, the spirit, and the next sexual revolution. And the core heart, the heart of our series, um, entitled Loved, has been this verse from 1 John 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, that our identity is that we are a child of God. For those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, that is who we are. It's our primary identity. And I hope that that has been your experience, to be reminded of that week in, week out, that you are deeply loved by the Father. And so here on the last uh, Sunday of our series, I just want to ask, how's the journey? How is the journey going for you? If you were here eight weeks ago, I told a story about my dad at a dinner table who said he was on a journey. And so I'm just wondering how your journey is going. How's the journey going? I hope that on this journey you've been challenged when it comes to truth, the truth of the word of God and the clarity that the scriptures bring in some of these issues. But I hope that you've been challenged with, with truth on this journey with Jesus. I also hope that on this journey you've been challenged, we've been challenged when it comes to love. When it comes to loving our neighbor. So as we follow Jesus, I hope that we have somewhere in the deep parts of our life been challenged both in truth and in love. And I hope that all of us can gain clarity as we follow Jesus as an apprentice. As Leslie Newbegin says, and I've shared this quote with you before, he says it this way. He says, if the biblical story does not control our thinking, then we'll be swept into the story the world tells about itself. And my hope is that we would be swept into Jesus' story, the story that Jesus is telling about who you are, about the state of the world, and the remedy that he brings to the world. So today as we land this plane, I think about what Jesus has been teaching us these past couple months, and I just want to share an image. It was a number of weeks ago I was doing some, some, uh, some research, some study on, on what happened uh, in the AIDS crisis in the late 80s and early 90s. And I came up across this photo, and I just want to warn you, this image uh, is hard to look at, so, uh, but you can put it up on the screen. Life magazine had this photo uh, of a man named David Kirby who was dying. Uh, minutes after this picture was taken, he died of AIDS. And this photo was influential in changing people's hearts towards those suffering with AIDS. So Life had this uh, in their magazine in, in the year 1990. And Life magazine wrote this about David Kirby. David Kirby was born and raised in a small town in Ohio. A gay activist in the 1980s, he learned in the late 80s while he was living in California and estranged from his family that he had contracted HIV he got in touch with his parents and asked if he could come home. He wanted, he said, to die with family around him. The Kirbys welcomed their son back. And here they are embracing him on the last day of life. A family that's been reconciled the last day of his life. <clears throat> so 
I know you just saw it there on the screen, but if you look close, um, we can zoom in. Do you see the hands of Jesus? I thought it was interesting. I was, I was looking at the photo and I paused and I was like, hey, that's Jesus. Those are his hands. This painting is uh, a painting that was hanging in, in the room. It's by an artist named Jay Reed. He painted it in the 1960s. I'm sure many of you will see a painting just like this hanging in hospital rooms. It's entitled, Come Unto Me. That's the name of the painting. Come Unto Me. Echoing the invitation of Jesus in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Look at the hands of Jesus outstretched, right, towards David Kirby. Was that the posture that the church took? in the 80s and 90s towards the gay community? The picture was so influential and it could have clued the church in. Could it could have been a clue for us of the posture of Jesus. Sorry, I, I didn't actually realize that <laughs> that photo was, uh, was that powerful. Just as I'm preaching on it here, I just can sense the love of God for all people. His hands are outstretched. And what does he say? He just says, come to me. Come to me. It's Jesus' posture towards you today. Come to me. These are the hands of Jesus stretched out for us. Because this series, I hope you know, has been for all of us. It's about all of us. We're all a part of this. As we talk about same-sex marriage, as we talk about the, that sex is found in the context of a marriage between a man and a woman, as we talk about gender identity and clarity on how to honor God with our body, uh, just a reminder is that this whole series is always about all of us. No matter where we're at, like I said in the first week, in our age, we have been affected by the fact that sex has become king and attractions have become identities. And each of us in the room, we're affected somehow. The adultery that affected your family, the divorce for non-biblical reasons that affected your family, the emotional affairs, the polyamory, the pornography, the lust, it's all part of this. There's also the emotional effect, the, the emptiness that some of us feel, the loneliness, the sadness, the fear some of us have for our children, the anxiety over finding the right spouse, the sadness due to a broken marriage, whether it's the sin that we have chosen to do or the sin that someone has done to us and the pain we now live in or the pain we see in the life of someone we love. Each of us have been affected by our secular age when sex became king and attractions became identities. But to each of us, on this last Sunday, I want to say this. Jesus holds out his hands, hands outstretched, saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And there's a moment in the scriptures, in John chapter 4. If you have your Bible, you feel free to turn to John chapter 4. We're going to look at a story um, about Jesus who met with a broken and a marginalized woman one day. Let me tell you a little bit of the backstory. Jesus is leaving Judea and headed back to Galilee. He didn't take the long way. Most Jews would take the long way around Samaria to avoid their enemies. But he cuts right through Samaria, enemy territory for the Jews. And he and his disciples end up in a town in Samaria called Sychar. It, there's a famous well there. Jacob's well is there. And it was about noon, and Jesus was tired and thirsty. So he asks a Samaritan woman for a drink. But she seems like she's on the margins in life. Why? Because she's there at noon. She's there at noon. That may not strike us as weird the first time we read the story, but... This woman is there at noon, and the normal time for uh, women, often in this culture at this time, to gather water would have been early in the morning or late in the evening. In the cool of the day, they would have these water runs to the well. But this lady comes at noon, 
It's the moment of the day. It's in the heat of the day. It's probably the moment where she would least likely, it's least likely to be able to run into somebody that she might know or someone that, that knows her, her story. She's a woman on the margins. And there she is. She's shocked that a Jewish man, A, would speak to her. So Jesus speaks to her. So she's shocked by that. And she's shocked that a Jewish man would ask her for a drink. And Jesus begins to teach her. In Judaism at the time, the rabbis, Jewish teachers, taught that learning about the Bible or theological education was for men alone. It was not only considered a waste of time to teach a woman, but a profaning of sacred things to teach a woman. But here Jesus is, in enemy territory, with a woman on the margins, in the heat of the day, and teaching her about worship and about the Holy Spirit. So let me read to you some of the words that Jesus shares with her. We're in John 4, starting in verse 10. We'll read verses 10 to 14. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink... You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. Notice the hands of Jesus. The hands of Jesus to to his enemy to a woman on the margins of life. His hands are outstretched. Come to me. I'll give you living water. Living water, an image of the Spirit of God. Jesus is saying, I can give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who is God himself, who is God in us, the Holy Spirit will allow you to drink deep of God. It's communion with God. It's nearness to God. It's interesting because she launches in, we won't look at it today, but they launch into a story about worship, right? And so there's two different mountains. Samaritans worshiped on this mountain and Jews worshiped on this mountain. And who was the right, you know, where was the right space of worship? And yet what is Jesus doing? He's inviting her to the most intimate place of worship, the spirit of God in you. No longer the spirit only in rooms behind walls in a temple, but the spirit of God in you. Here at the well with a marginalized woman, he's saying, come and drink deep of God. Come and drink deep. Let's pick up at verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. It's an interesting moment. She she wants the water, right? Like, she really wants this living water, but Jesus asks her for her story. He asks her for some honesty. It's like Jesus is pausing and he's looking at her and he's saying, yes, the water is yours. You can drink deeply of the water, but tell me who you really are. Who are you? What's your story? What's, what's the brokenness in your story? What's, where's the pain in your story? And her story is exposed. And her story is complicated. She's had five husbands. And the man she's with is not her husband. What's the backstory here? We don't know. We don't know. Theologians kind of speculate on what could have been the backstory, but we we actually don't know. 
She's had five husbands. Have they all died? Has she been left a widow five times over? Did these men leave her? Were these men abusive towards her? And the man she's with now, she's not married to him. And, and in such a traditional society, no wonder she comes to get water in the middle of the day. And this is me speculating, but I wonder, it's just, I, I, I don't want to hear the gossip. I don't want to see the stares. I don't want to hear what people are saying about me. I don't want to hear the judgment. But Jesus sees her. He sees her. And he wants to know her story. He already knew her story. He already knows everything about her. And of all the people in the town, he picks her. Again, he's in enemy territory. He's in a small town in enemy territory. He's hanging out with a marginalized woman in this small town in enemy territory. And he offers her the spirit of God. In her broken story and in the pain of her story, he offers her living water. Out of all the people in the town, he picks her. And he picks you. The hands of Jesus are outstretched for her and they're outstretched for you. Come to me and I'll give you living water. This is the offer I hope each of us today sees from Jesus. This series is about all of us. Where have you felt shame? Where have you felt addiction or walk through addiction? Where have you felt temptation? Where have you been frustrated? Where have you lived in pain? When have you been lonely? Where have you been fearful? See, Jesus pauses, he looks at us, he sees us, he knows everything about our story, he knows the deep things that we've told no one. He knows the deep things we've told no one. And those hands that were outstretched for David Kirby are the same hands that are outstretched for the woman at the well. And they're the exact same hands that are outstretched for you. Come, drink deep of the Holy Spirit. Come to me and you can drink deep of living water. I'll satisfy. That's the message of Jesus. Everything, I'll give you life. I'll satisfy you in a parched land. It's interesting, I, uh, in some of this journey that we've been on, I, uh, I just noticed that the sexual revolution has left us thirsty for real love. It's left us so thirsty for real love. Did you know, this is just a little interesting fact, did you know that the sexual revolution led to what historians call the golden age of porn, 1969 to 1984? The, go the golden age of porn. Like when I read about that, I was like, that is like the, that is, what is that, first of all? I was like, what, what does that even mean? And historians say porn during these years was held in high esteem by film critics. You know, and the idea was like, hey, this, this pornography could lead to the sexual liberation of men and women. It's going to transform our culture. 35 years later, nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about the golden age of porn. 35 years later, people see the horrendous effect that porn is having on our culture and it is not good. Nobody is talking about the golden age of porn. The sexual revolution has left our secular culture thirsty for real love. That was a, that was a lie, right? Where's the real love? Like, where can I find true intimacy? And the whole time, Jesus' hands are outstretched. Come to me. I'll give you living water. 
And as we drink, we're transformed. As we drink deep of the Holy Spirit, he begins to do things in us that are beautiful. As we drink deep of God, as you drink deep of God, he then makes life start to grow in you. New fruit starts to grow from our tree, as it were, of our life. Listen to the fruit of the Spirit. We often give this this list here at North Langley, but listen to the fruit of the Spirit. As you drink deep, this is the fruit that grows. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does the world need more of that? You bet. Think about the impact of, of, of these words on the screen when it comes to identity, sexuality, and gender. When you drink deep of the Holy Spirit, he causes love. Let's look at the first word, love, to grow in you. The Spirit shows what a faithful and sacrificial love looks like. Not a love that just simply seeks out pleasure, but a love that's rooted in sacrificial giving. Joy. Not a relationship based on pleasure or what I can get out of the relationship, but real joy in relationships. Patience. Patience. Not trying to live impulsively by gratifying our own sexual appetite, but patience. Kindness. Speaking to men specifically, men treating women and children with kindness. Faithfulness. The Spirit makes us faithful. Imagine a church, vision casting here, imagine a church known for its faithfulness. No adultery, no pornography, no affairs. faithful. You drink deep of the Holy Spirit. You come to the one who offers you with the hands outstretched. You begin to drink deeply of God. You find intimacy in God. You realize that you are so loved. You're the beloved child of God. And, And all of a sudden, the Spirit grows faithfulness in you. Transformation. Self control. Come on. I don't have to explain that one. Self control. When it comes to our current secular world, and when it comes to sexuality, what an amazing fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. See, you know, God is just delighted to start growing this in us. As we drink deep of the Holy Spirit, we're then transformed. Our ethics are transformed. Our character is transformed. Our trust in God's gift of the body, our trust in God's design for sex, our trust in God's blueprint for marriage increases. We're transformed as we drink deep of the Spirit, and then we are known for things like self-control and faithfulness. If the world looked at your life or your family or your story our story here at North Langley, if they knew you attended North Langley, and would they think, oh, that's a bunch of faithful people. Those people have self-control. Those people are kind. It's kind people. If I looked to the people, if I asked the people that worked for you, would they say, oh, he's kind. He's gentle. (laughs) He shows so much self-control. And when we're transformed, the world catches on. And it happened 2,000 years ago. I want to give us a little hope today. It happened 2,000 years ago. Let me tell you about the real first sexual revolution, and it was a good one. At the time the New Testament was written, men in Roman society were allowed to do basically whatever they wanted. Sex with prostitutes, sex with slaves, sex sex with young boys. The only thing a Roman male was not allowed to do was to have sex with another Roman male's wife. So adultery with another Roman male, that was offside. But anything else was permissible. Early Christians come around and taught that, taught their men, 
here in churches popping up all over the Mediterranean, the church taught their men that sex is reserved for the covenant of marriage. That the sexual drive that a man had is reserved exclusively only for his wife. Think about how countercultural that would have been. I read tons of documents just all about the promiscuity of Roman men, able to do whatever they wanted. And here comes along this little tiny church. They're followers of this rabbi in Israel. They're, they're called the Way. And they're popping up all over the Mediterranean. And, and they teach their men to only express their sexuality in the confines of a marriage towards their wife. What did this mean? It meant that young boys, slaves, and prostitutes were safe around Christian men. It also meant the Roman Empire looked at Christian wives and Christian wives could trust that their husbands would be faithful. By the way, I know when I say a sentence like that, there's a lot of pain in the room. Imagine thousands upon thousands in the Roman Empire watching Christians and seeing something different about the way they were living. And I want to ask you this. At the end of the day, which sexual ethic won over the empire? 300 years later, what became the sexual ethic of the Roman Empire? It was the Jesus way. It's the church. Now, there's a lot of weird stuff that happened during that time in history as well. But just notice, an entire empire was turned upside down, starting off by this little group of Jesus followers, simply trusting that when they felt like they were on the wrong side of history, they weren't. They would just be faithful. God's heart for sex and marriage, no matter how hard it would have seemed, it was good for the world. Kyle Harper in his 2013 book, From Shame to Sin, The Christian Transformation of Sexual Morality in Late Antiquity. It's a real page turner, coffee table book. <laughs> he argues that, Christ, that, that the Christian sexual morality transformed the Roman Empire, as I've been saying here. He said that the Christian sexual ethic was simple. Sex was for marriage between a man and a woman. That's it. It's not complicated. It's just very, very simple. Anything outside that was offside. And he shows the impact. He writes that this simple but clear ethic allowed the church to emphasize things like virginity before marriage, faithfulness in a marriage, one man, one woman is the blueprint for marriage, and that this was a revolution that took over the promiscuity of the Roman and Greek worlds. He writes this, the most astonishing development of late antiquity is the transformation of a radical sexual ideology for centuries the possession of a small, strident band of vociferous dissenters. I love that. He's talking about the church there. Vociferous dissenters. <laughs> it's so cool. Someone should put that on a shirt. Into a culture, a broadly shared public framework of values and meaning. By the way, I don't know Kyle Harper. This is a Harvard, Harvard Press. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. He's, just, he's, he's a historian. He's saying, this is what happened. There were these vociferous dissenters. And they grew and grew. And it became a culture. The church, the strident band of vociferous dissenters, a little group that kept drinking deep of the Holy Spirit. They kept drinking deep of the Spirit of God that would transform them from the inside out. And they grew and grew, and their sexual ethic was attractive in a promiscuous world. And it was attractive to all kinds of Roman citizens looking at that, going, that's what I want. How many women looked at those marriages, that's what I want. That's a place where my kids will be safe. Like that is a place of faithfulness. And the fruit of the Spirit began to change how they lived. And, and all it was, it was just Christians for 300 years continuing to come. Come. Jesus says, come. Just drink deep. I'll change you. I'll change you. Just come. Drink deep of the living water. And it led to the true sexual revolution. Tim Keller writes it like this. He, he 
has an interesting way of saying it. He said, the reason Christianity triumphed in the Roman Empire is because it offered a way of life that was attractive. He said the surrounding Greco-Roman culture was this, sexually promiscuous and financially guarded. So they're pretty free with their sex and guarded with their money. And he said this little followers of Jesus, the way came around. And early Christians were, he calls it, promiscuous with their money, but guarded with their bodies. They flipped it around. They were generous with their money. They were generous with their hospitality. But they guarded, they were sexually chaste. They were guarded with their sexuality, trusting God's ethic. An early church document called the Epistle of Methetus to Diognetes says this, describing Christians in the Roman Empire. He writes, they have a common table, but not a common bed. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They ate with each other. They were hospitable to one another. They welcomed in the poor to eat with them, to have food to eat. They were generous with their money, right? But they did not have a common bed. And what does it do to an empire? Turns it upside down. When our culture sees the impact of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, it will lead to a new sexual revolution. And that's something we can pray about. As Madeline Langle, uh, author of The Wrinkle in Time, she writes this. She says, we draw people to Christ by showing them a light so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know its source. Isn't that beautiful? We draw people to Christ by showing them a light so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know its source. Last week, I ended uh, the sermon talking about the difference between a battlefield and an oasis. And I just want to go back to that quick. A battlefield is when two armies are ready to march against one another in a culture war. An oasis is a people of care, compassion, and the truth of Jesus in a world that's parched for living water. Let's let's take the oasis route. If you were to ask the LGBTQ community, what do you think, when you think of church, what do you think? Would they say kindness? It's a fruit of the Spirit. Would they think culture war, or would they think an oasis? Yeah, we don't agree, right? I'm not talking about agreement. (laughs) Yeah, we don't agree, but that's a place, that's an oasis. It's a place of real kindness. It's a place of gentleness. Romans 2.4 says this, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Let's let's make sure our posture, for some of us who are, we've been Christians for many years and we're trusting God's sexual ethic and it feels like the culture around us just is, uh, as they're not in agreement, we feel that we're being attacked, right? That's a feeling that some of us in the room have. Just remember Romans 2, 4, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. The posture of Jesus is this. Again, if I asked your neighbor, coworker, or family member what you're like, would they use the words found in the fruit of the Spirit? Oh, he's loving. He's joyful. He's so peaceful. He's patient. He's kind. He's good. He's faithful. He's gentle. And he has so much self-control. If not, how could we come again today and drink deeply of the Holy Spirit? As Preston Sprinkle says, the greatest apologetic for truth is love. North Langley, we're not looking at all to compromise on the truth of Jesus or the truth of the word, but our greatest apologetic for truth is love. So today I just want to ask if you have come today feeling hypocritical about your own sin. Let's drink deep of God. If we have come today feeling marginalized, pushed to the edge, if we've come feeling addicted or confused or lonely or self-righteous, let's drink once again deeply of the Holy Spirit, of the living water. 
If we're going to be an oasis for a parched, sec secular, hypersexualized world, we need to be changed first, right? We have to be healed first. We have to drink deeply of the Spirit first. And we find our healing at the cross. Today is, uh, and I'm bringing this to an end here, um, for the last six weeks, I've introduced you to a friend. And uh, I don't have someone to come share their story because as I end today, I want you to see the story of Jesus. Watch his story, listen to his story for a moment. On the cross in John chapter 19, on the cross, He's crucified, he's giving up his life for the world, he's pouring out his love for the world. And in John 19, verses 28 to 29, we read this. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. What's going on here? My professor, Daryl Johnson, he said this. He says, the man who gives living water is thirsty. Look at Jesus for a minute. Maybe you want to turn to the cross there. Maybe you want to close your eyes and just picture Jesus. But think about Jesus for a minute. Think about his story. The one who had approached the woman at the well in John 4 and put his hands out and offered her living water, he He's nailed to pieces of wood, and he, he's thirsty. The one who offers living water was thirsty. The one who made the best wine in John chapter 2, he's forced to drink wine vinegar. Do you see an exchange happening? Our rags for his riches, our sin for his forgiveness, our sinful life for his perfect life. Do you see this beautiful exchange happening? He's thirsty so that you would drink. He goes without so that you might drink deeply of God. And then, maybe you see this in your mind's eye or you see this as you look to the cross, just see the moment when he's pierced. A Roman soldier takes a spear and pierces his side. And a mixture of blood and water pour from his side. And as water pours out from the side of Jesus, we remember the words 500 years before this moment. When the prophet Zechariah speaks of a moment when God would be pierced. Listen to this. This is God speaking in the book of Zechariah. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, a fountain will be opened. North Langley, on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On the day God is pierced, a fountain will be opened to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Water will flow. When the rock is struck, water will flow. And you can drink deeply of God. I want to lead us in a moment of prayer. Would you close your eyes? Or just spend a moment in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, would you come and would you draw us to the Father? Lord, as we look back on these last eight weeks, We want to acknowledge our own sin and our own brokenness before you.
we're sorry, Lord, for the ways in which we have trespassed and lived in ways that have not honored you. Forgive us, Lord. We also come with uh, pain from the ways in which we've been hurt by those in our life. And so whether it's our own uh, sinful choices or the sinful choices of those who have hurt us, we see that like the woman at the well, you, your hands are outstretched for us. Those hands stretched out over David Kirby's life or the hands stretched out over our life and we just, we reach out to you. And we want to drink deeply of you. Come and fill us, Jesus. Come and pour your love upon us. Come and forgive us and cleanse us and make us new. Jesus, would you work a transformation in our church in such a deep way that that the world around us would look and, and want this. God, that they would want you, that they would desire to have you. Revelation twenty two seventeen. the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. I'd love to invite our communion servers for